Hello, I'm Dan Gibson, and this video is about the Petra Scrolls. These old scrolls were found in the ancient city of Petra in Jordan way back in 1993. They were discovered by archaeologists in the back room of an ancient church. Most of the church structure had collapsed so that the scrolls were discovered under the rubble. The second thing to note is that all 140 scrolls had been burned. They were charred black and some scrolls were broken into many pieces. A team of experts from Finland worked at carefully opening the scrolls and then photographing them and getting the best photos we could possibly get. Those photographs were made available to experts around the world who mulled over the contents of the scrolls and wrote various papers and expressed various opinions. In the year 2002, the American Center for Oriental Research published a five-volume collection called the Petra Scrolls. I have a copy of the five volumes here. Their rest are behind me. And uh, over the last six months, I've enjoyed working my way through these books and also reading some of the opinions of the experts who comment uh, on uh, the, uh, the scrolls and what they found. Now, here are some things we should notice. First, the scrolls belong to one extended family. They are the personal legal documents of that family. They are the kinds of things you might stick away in a safety deposit box and not look at for years. But you don't want to get rid of them because it might be useful someday. They're legal documents. Second, even though the scrolls were found in a church, they are not church documents. This is not about uh, who was baptized, who the priests were, or how the church was organized. No, this is about one family's legal records. Third, what is of interest here is not so much what the scrolls say, but how they say things. The names that are used, the people that are mentioned, the language that is expressed. Fourth, the dates of these scrolls are very important. These scrolls were written down during the time that the Prophet Muhammad was a young man. That's what makes them so important to our study, uh, our study of Kiblis. Uh, here we have a very narrow window back into time. Let me emphasize it's an extremely narrow window. It's all about one family. It's a Christian family. These are legal documents that were found in the Christian quarter in Petra in the back room of a church. We must not expect them to throw light onto the pagan side of the city or the greater picture of what's going on. Now, here's a, a drawing of Petra. And it is a in a valley, and the Christian churches are here on one side, and the Christian tombs are up here in the north. The rest of the city was pagan, or at least until Muhammad came along. Here are the temples to Dushera and Al-Uzza and others. And of course, there's the foundation of the original Kaaba building. None of these structures were ever uh, connected to churches or converted into churches. There's little evidence that uh, that ever happened, but they were in use at the time. Down in the south are the sites that would be later associated with Muslim pilgrimage. At the time the, that the scrolls were written, they, these were all pagan sites. There were camping spots and uh, where the pilgrims to Petra would, could stay. There was a, a pillar there that pilgrims could throw their stone at. There was the slippery slope that pilgrims could climb up to the top of the mountain. Large crowds of pagans could gather there and face the sunset. Even Christians could gather, as there was also a Christian church there for Christian pilgrims. For the tomb of Aaron, the brother of Moses, was on that mountaintop. But outside of the church on the top of the mountain and the Christian quarter in the city, by and large, the city of Petra still seems to have remained a pagan city. The Byzantines ruled from a distance, and the area around Petra and to the north was controlled by Christian tribes who were the uh, client rulers for the Byzantines. But this really was the back uh, side of the Byzantine Empire. A few scattered churches had been built in Arabia, but overall, all of Central and North Arabia was still in the hands of pagans. It was into this situation that Muhammad was born. His family were pagans who worshipped the gods of Petra. His wife was a merchant woman, typical of the families of Petra. 
His wife's first cousin was a Nestorian merchant in the city where Muhammad lived. If that had been Mecca down in Saudi Arabia, what was a Nestorian priest doing down there? But it was in Petra in Jordan, also known as the Mecca, where it and it would fit perfectly into that Petra landscape. Now, fifth, some people have assumed that the city of Petra was totally in ruins during the lifetime of Muhammad. This is simply not the case. After every earthquake, people dug themselves out and rebuilt their homes. That is what appears to have happened in Petra. Any destruction from the earthquake in 551 was cleaned up just as uh, the city recovered from the earthquake of uh, 363 AD. So when the Petra scrolls were written, there was a thriving city. People were active in the area all around Petra. The records of this Christian family record how they bought and sold land and paid taxes uh, throughout this whole period. Anyone who says that Petra was in ruins simply doesn't understand history and the history of this region. The city is in ruins today, but it's 1500 years later. Back then, it was still an active city. Around it, people were still doing agriculture. Merchants still came and went. Stores were open. Churches and temples still functioned. Christians and pagans lived in their own parts of the city. So the very first thing we learn about from the Petra Scrolls is that Petra was an active city. Now, there were about 140 different scrolls, and out of them, they had to break them open. This gives you an example of sort of what uh, you would be looking at as the scroll is unrolled. Lots of fragments, and so there's five volumes in this set with all the different fragments in it and the translations and so forth. When I went through the scrolls, I noticed that there were a lot of different legal documents. There were agreements on family property. There were agreements on inheriting family land. There was the dividing of land between three brothers. And there's lots and lots of taxation receipts. There was an agreement to transfer taxes to another person, several of those. There was a dowry agreement and a marriage contract. There were several private letters and there was agreements for the settlement of debts. There was a donation letter, even a list of stolen items and the accusation of a priest who was using the house at the time and seems to have moved away and uh, taken with them some of the contents of the house. So lots of different documents uh, that we can look at, but nothing that tells us specifically about what's going on in the greater area around or in Petra. In reading the scrolls, it's obvious that Petra was an active city. Now, there are lots of little things that can be learned from the Petra Scrolls. One of the most interesting and enlightening is that while Greek was the official language of the state, most of the people spoke Arabic. You see, the Petra Scrolls are written in the Greek language, but they're filled with all sorts of Arabic words. Names of places, names of objects and things, uh, terms used and concepts expressed. So experts have been studying the Arabic language used in Petra through the Petra scrolls. For instance, uh, there's a talk of, uh, of bir, a bir, which is a well or a cistern. The term bir arabias is a mixture of Greek and Arabic, and it may be the root of the where we get Araba from, from Wadi Araba. The, the name Aram uh, or Aram is uh, the field markers. Hibla is the name of grapes. The name of grace is Nama. Uh, so there's a name, Nam El, which is known to us in the Safiatic inscription. And here we find it. Ain is a spring of water. Beit is a house. Beit Akbar is a large house. Uh, Darja is our steps or terraces. Uh, Hamra is a red or brownish and, and Sharka, uh, Sharkia is a eastern and so forth. So there's, there's lots of different words that show up there. Nahar is a, uh, is a gully and a, a sar, sarge is a, like a hill or a saddle. It could even be an inverted cooking pot. Um, and uh, mal is property or the things that you own and 
Uh, Marbas is a uh, threshing floor, and Nusba is a uh, farm, and so forth. Just as you go through, there's just so many words, and you realize that these people were actually expressing with each other and talking to each other using the Arabic language. Tribes were known in terms like Beni or the son of. And you'll find pages and pages of these words, especially Arabic used for names of places. Also of interest are the names of people. The Nabataean Arabs started using Greek names as early as King Aretas, who called himself Philopatrius. Uh, this uh, king is mentioned in the Bible, and many Nabataeans used Greek names after that. So it's hard to distinguish between an Arab name and a Greek name as they were using Greek names. One prominent person is Abu Karib ibn Jabala, who's the ruler of the Ghassanids, and uh, he's the arbitrator in one of the legal disputes. His name is even found in the histories of Al Tabri and others. So it's exciting to see Arab names that are in history uh, be there on the, those scrolls. So then, what are the most important things we can learn from the Petrus scrolls? First and foremost, it has to do with the Arabic language. You see, all over the Middle East, there are thousands of pre-Quranic ancient Arabic inscriptions and names, but none of them reflect the sort of Arabic that's found in the Quran. You see, in the Quran, the definite article is L. And uh, if the word for house is bait, then if I want to say the house, I would say el bait. That is what you would find in the Quran or in classical Arabic today. But Dr. Michael McDonald and others who have worked on these thousands of ancient inscriptions in graffiti across the Middle East, they found very few instances of L being used. The most common uh, use for the definite article is HN, Hin, or just H. So uh, that's the definite article, but the Quran only uses L. So how and where and when did the HN evolve into L? The early language used in Central Arabia around Mecca in Saudi was different from the Arabic of the Quran. It also contains words from the Southern Arabian dialects. The language of the Quran is also different from the Arabic spoken by the Bedouin. So how can the Quran claim to be in the language of the people? Why can we not find any use of this type of Arabic anywhere in the Middle East? Recently, Ahmed al-Jalad uh, did a survey, Greco-Arabia in the southern Levant. This region includes the uh, southern Syria and places like Umm Jemal and Basra uh, and the, uh, the Hauran uh, Desert. It also includes central and southern Jordan, places such as ancient Moab, Edom, Petra, and the Hisma, this, uh, air, and over in the Negev as well, Beersheba, Alusa, Nasana. These areas coincide with the areas that were under Nabataean control when the Romans absorbed the Nabataeans in 106 AD. At that time, the area was renamed Arabia Petria, or Arabia of the Two Petras, and it was administered from Basra in Syria. Now, Dr. Mark Drury, a linguist, in his paper on the origins of the Quranic Arabic, mentions that there are five features that can be identified as particular to this region and found in the Quran. These include the use of the Tamar Buta, uh, the Aleph Maksura, the glottal stop, the letter L, uh, and so forth. Now, Muslim scholars for a long time have promoted the idea that the Bedouins speak the purest form of Arabic and have the purest Arabic uh, culture. But this is not supported by linguists such as Jalad and Duri. Uh, the Arabic closest to the Quran uh, was found in and around Petra. And the language of the, it's a language of the city, not of the desert. The Quran often speaks derogatorily of those it calls Arabs. These are the desert-dwelling Bedouin. There's some references on your screen if you want to look up where the Quran speaks in rather derogatory uh, way about the Arabs. But it's because the Quran was written for urban people with an urban background that you get this slant.
The evidence that the linguists put forward suggests that the Arabic in which the Quran was recited and written was actually Nabataean Arabic. The Nabataean variety, it is suggested, would have been widely understood throughout the Arabic-speaking region because of the Nabataean traders and their whole network of trade. But it was not considered to be a different language from what the Bedouin spoke. They spoke a different dialect, but this was claimed, the language of the Quran is claimed to be clearer and more easily understood. It's the kind of Arabic that the merchants and the poets used. The Nabataeans preferred to write in Aramaic and later in Greek, but they spoke Arabic at home. That's why early Muslim scholars could not find the source of the Arabic language. They're assuming it came from the Bedouins, but uh, it could not be found among the Bedouin tribes. This is because Nabataean Arabic was not a Bedouin variety. You see, once Petra had disappeared and the Nabataean identity had dissipated, Nabataean Arabic was no longer distinctive to the region. Uh, Muhammad's family and the Arabs of Petra and of Homema took this Arabic dialect with them to Damascus as they went as rulers, and later as Abbasid rulers went to Iraq, and it became the common property of Arabs everywhere, this language, this dialect. It was not until the discovery of the Petra scrolls that linguists could start putting the pieces of the puzzle together. It took Greek documents in Petra to reveal the origins of Quranic Arabic. I'm Dan Gibson, and this has been another video in the series Archaeology and Islam.